Uh, I'm Melissa McDaniel with Turning Point Dance Creations, and this is Bree Zabrowski from Apollo Performance. Um, and we are so excited to be on this journey beyond the steps with you. Our topic today is how can dance educators integrate students on the autism spectrum into their current curriculum? Um, so I know that a lot of us, this is, the, this is something that has come to light in the dance community, um, definitely in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And many people have created whole curriculums around students um, who are on the autism spectrum, who have autism spectrum disorders. Um, so many people have created whole programs. I've seen whole studios that are dedicated to serving this population of students. And some of you may have not even thought of the challenges that face students. Um, with autism spectrum disorders. So that's what this show is all about. We want to bring to light um, some of the challenges that they may face and some of the ways that we can definitely better serve them and explore all of the possibilities of making the studios a welcoming place um, for, for kids with autism spectrum disorders and set them up for the greatest level of success possible. So I uh, definitely want to get into introducing our guest, Bree. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. And we're excited to have Kelly Flansberg here with us today. Kelly's formal education in creative arts uh, in therapy with a concentration in dance therapy has provided her with a lot of different hands-on experiences with different ages and abilities. Um, as a student, she had the opportunity to work with at-risk adolescent children with autism spectrum disorder um, and elderly patients with Parkinson's disease and dementia. In addition, her dance training and dance teaching experience span over 20 years for all ages and abilities. Uh, she was fortunate to attend and train at the New York State Summer School of the Arts. Uh, she, Earl Mosley, and Streb Extreme Action, and she's a co-founder of East Gay Arts Collective. Her goal as a teacher, dancer, and artist is to share passion for movement and expression with others. So Kelly, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, tell us about how and why you developed your passion for making dance accessible to people with uh, from all ages to all ability levels. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, I'm so excited to be joining you guys today. Um, this is definitely one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, obviously when I was really young, I started dancing, um, a lot of different genres, ballet, modern. Um, and when I graduated high school, I knew that I didn't want to go to a conservatory. I knew I wanted to kind of broaden my spectrum a little bit. Um, and I went, I attended Russell Sage College, which is a super small all girls school in upstate New York. And it happened to be one of seven schools in the country that offered creative arts and therapy as an undergrad degree. Um, and I was actually originally going in to be a Spanish education major. Oh my goodness. <laughs> totally. We just veered off a little bit. <laughs> I was like, I went in and I was like, hey, I have all these Spanish credits. And my, um, <laughs> my advisor was like, I think we have something that you might like really like. I was like, it's like, okay, let's check it out. And I, it, I just fell in love with kind of dance therapy and the program in general. Um, and so from there, every semester we worked with a different group of individuals, starting with seniors, um, at-risk youth. And then my last semester, I worked with children with autism where we brought um, almost 15 kids into school and we worked with them um, every week for about two months, yeah. at the end of our semester. And I was super fortunate enough to work my senior year um, with an occupational therapist at the Spotted Zebra Learning Center in upstate New York, which is a preschool um, that specializes in integrating students um, with autism spectrum disorder into a normal classroom. Um, so it's just pre-K and kindergarten, um, and they focus on getting students ready to just go to a public kindergarten class. Um, so I worked closely with an occupational therapist to develop um, different techniques so kids could pay attention easier in class. And it's just kind of, I, I absolutely love it. Every student is a puzzle. It's a great learning experience. Um, and then from there, I just kind of grew um, out of there. I started working at a summer program called Moving Wheels and Heels, um, where we did kind of, we tried to have a one-on-one -on -one adult and child with uh, a disability uh, paired with a intern or a teacher. Um, and we, it was like a two full week dance intensive. Um, and then keep going, fast forward. Um, I'm currently the outreach coordinator for Malishock Dance um, in San Diego, um, where I kind of 
do a whole lot of things. I run the average program. So I bring teaching artists into schools, um, which I have done in New York. I've done in upstate New York. I've done in San Diego. I've done all over the place. And I kind of realized being a dance teacher and then being a teaching artist are totally different things. Yeah. You know, being a dance teacher, you have the same kids every week. You have them for the full year. You can really work on something. And then being a teaching artist, you're going into a school environment for like an hour and you're not really prepped. And that's kind of when I realized that um, if you're a teaching artist or um, a dance educator in any form, you have to be like totally prepped for whatever students come into your classroom. And that's kind of when I realized that um, being an outreach coordinator, having to train my teaching artists to expect the unexpected when it comes to your classroom and how to better prepare teachers to teach in all, all forms, all students. Um, so that's why I love talking about this. It's also very exciting. Yeah, it really is so important because, it, it, you know, your dance isn't regulated as it is. We talk about that a lot on the show. Um, there's not a whole lot of regulation or um, procedure for, for very much, right? You, you taught how you were taught and you it's very cyclical um and so having these um these guidelines and this framework for um how to because no no it's not cookie cutter no kid is the same no person is the same and so understanding the the proper way to to address every student that comes in your classroom is important and it's 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 equally important you know um, autistic students deserve the same amount of attention as a, a student that has ADD who has uh, you know no learning disability at all and so it, it really um, it's important that I think we address that and there's there's been I want to I know we're going to touch on this through the show but there's been some great programs and developments um, in programming that that educators can take advantage of so we're I know we're going to highlight a lot of that on this this episode but um, Melissa let's dive in and let's let's start with the, get to the good stuff oh wait you're muted <laughs> we'll get the hang of it eventually it's like 10 nine episodes in <laughs> nine episodes in and I'm still talking on mute it's unbelievable. Um, but we've already used this term a few times uh, already. So I definitely want to better define for people who may not understand um, or know it or even have heard it. So people use the term autism spectrum frequently. Yeah. Um, but Kelly, can you just give us a better understanding of what it means, what autism spectrum means? What does that mean? What, what type of disorders does that include? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, autism spectrum disorder is a bio neurological development disability. Um, and, um, so it's a disorder that affects the development of the nervous system. And this can happen on um, a lot of different levels. Um, it's often characterized by repetitive characteristics and patterns of behavior, um, whether that's socially, um, communication, interaction, um, there's often like a difficulty or like I said, again, um, some sort of like a pattern. Um, so it, um, it affects the normal development of the brain in certain areas. And obviously, mm -hmm. as we all know, we have so many different parts of our brain. Um, right. So this can really be, like we said before, every student is totally different. Every um, child with autism spectrum disorder is completely different. No child is alike. Um, which is kind of why I love this. It's kind of like a puzzle. Um, so kind of it can stem from, or it can show signs in like nonverbal communication, social interactions, um, kind of play activities. Um, and again, it's the hard part is it's different for our every student. Um, right. So it's not like you can have a cookie cutter idea of what this is. Right. And it ranges from mild to extreme. Right. Um, someone who could just be sitting in a classroom but has has to repeatedly repeated, oh my gosh, English today, has to like repeat the question to themselves over and over again, or they um, feel like they could write the write the answer to a question rather than say the answer to a question. Is it hard to diagnose because it could mimic so many other different, you know, issues, it, 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 it looks the same sometimes as some other things that we may see happen with, with children. Absolutely. And I mean, children growing up are 
so strange. There's so many, I mean, they could come down the stairs one morning and all of a sudden not like Cheerios or right. like, and at a, at a young age, it's kind of hard to figure out what that, what it could develop into. Um, so obviously as a parent, everyone watches their children like hawks, you know, every like little tiny thing. And I'm not a mom currently, but I, I've worked with so many kids in so many different capacities and um, so you're obviously looking for everything and sometimes it is, it goes undiagnosed, um, yeah. until there's maybe a bigger, I don't want to say issue, um, but until there's something significant that happens, um, especially in children, like I said before, um, they're so, every day is different. Every day is new. They're learning new things and it might not develop until I don't know they they're learning math in school right. and maybe that's something because math and art are totally different sides of their brain um so like kindergarten is very arts creative um and then first grade second grade they're really developing into math and writing and that's a whole different side of their brain where that that might tend to draw out Kelly, what are um, so, some of the um, what are some of the actual diagnoses that are that are considered autism spectrum disorders? Because I know I've heard of Asperger's syndrome before. Um, are there, I know there's a number of different ones. What are some of the common ones that we hear a lot? Um, so what's interesting um, about that is like like we said, it's a spectrum, um, and so with autism and Asperger's, they're normally like co, there's like a co-morbid, uh, so there's always something attached to it. It tends to be the, a student might have, be on the autism spectrum disorder, but they also will most likely have something like ADHD or ADD or um, dyslexic or something that kind of pairs off with that, um, which is why the term spectrum is very interesting and a uh, very broad sense. Um, but I do like to think of it as a rainbow. You know, there's different shades, there's different, um, there's different colors. There's and different none of everything. them are, I assume that none of them are cut and dry. So you can't really say everything kind of mixes and blends, um, depends how a, spectrum, how a spectrum works. So I know I've had a number of students whose parents have disclosed that they, that they do fall somewhere on the spectrum. Um, are, are autism spectrum disorders or autistic students, um, autistic children, young people, is that very common these days, a common diagnosis? Or is it, is it just that now that doctors have a better awareness of it, we're actually diagnosing what needs to be, what needs to be diagnosed rather, rather than people going without the care that they need? Um, so yeah, the rate of autism is like, growing and I think it's a little bit of um you know this is okay this is like a shady area not like a shady area but um and I don't want to use the word overdiagnosed either um mm. but um according to the standards now um one out of 54 children um are diagnosed on the autism spectrum disorder um and boys yeah. are actually four times more likely to have autism um than girls that's just an stat that has been recently evaluated. Um, and again, like you said, I'm not entirely sure if it's just because we know what to look for now. So mm -hmm. now parents and as like, you know, I feel like mm -hmm. when even like my mom was growing up or something like that, um, you know, your kid goes to school and they're doing all these things and um, how child development and how child growth wasn't really evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, as much. And now there's so much, there's so many resources out there, um, where, you know, you have one little thing and your mom is like, Oh, on the internet and looking it up. Mm -hmm. and seeing what happens. So, um, yeah. And there's, like we said, there's such a spectrum, the word spectrum is in it. There's so many, there's so many levels. There's so many things behind it. 
Um, so but have, it, it's definitely steadily growing. I don't know if Bree. Oh yeah, I'm I'm looking at the chat. I was just talking on mute because that's you know what we do here on the show. Um, and we talk so you can't hear us. Um, we're getting lots of feedback, and and you know it's important to point out we're we're on this journey with you. Every week we say that we are we are here to learn. Um, we started our journey beyond the steps with episode one, just like you guys did. Um, you know, and so this is we're getting some really great feedback. Um, Elizabeth Kessler in our Zoom chat says. Um, for uh, identity first language is best uh, in referring to uh, to uh, autistic students is the, a great way to say it. So so autistic students is the the proper terminology. Um, and and you know she also agrees. Yes, always be prepped for disabled dancers and students. We're everywhere. Um, all autistic people are individuals, and they're they're different, just like everyone else. Um, and also noted that um, uh, autism is especially hard to diagnose in girls, um, which is which is interesting and, and very consistent with what you just told us, Kelly. Um, and then another comment um, in Facebook and uh, uh, Zoom is Asperger's technically doesn't exist anymore, but of course there are many people who are diagnosed while it still existed. Some people like the term and others do not. So we go with the term autistic students. Is that is that the general consensus, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, Elizabeth, I love it. She said, you know, I appreciate you learning. This is just an area I know. And that's exactly why we're here because if we're learning this, there's so many other people out there that, that need to learn this as well. And that is why we're here. So um, thank you for all of the great feedback and also Denise, uh, Eliza on Facebook for your comments as well. Um, Kelly, why do you think it's important that we are intentional with our efforts to integrate autistic students uh, into our curriculum? Why is that important? So this is uh, kind of like a interesting question. I think um, I, I obviously think it's super important. Um, I think that there's a little bit of a gray area, um, specifically when it when it comes to parents and so this is this is my main thought. Sorry for a lot of no. Lot it's of, okay. It's okay. I always think that parents are looking always looking out for their child. Always yep. always want the best. Um, and sometimes parents think that having them in a classroom that is specifically designed for them, where they can mold the environment, mold their curriculum to them, is best. And absolutely, there are certain cases that there is. But also at the same time, I think there's a large part of the child or the student that is feeling the same way is that they wanna feel included. They wanna feel like they're part of something. And a lot of times in schools, they're being taken out of the classroom or they're, you know, they can't go to dance class with Susie Q because their mom is putting them in a special class. Um, so there's, there's that battle too. And I think it's always, I think it's always going to be uh, a little, battle, but yeah. I think it is so important just because, and even as a dancer, um, you're always learning from people around you. Um, I think that, yeah. I think that dance is an open form of an expression of like the inner self, um, whether it's a ballet class, whether it's a modern class, you're going in and you're doing your best and you're expressing yourself from the inside out, from the outside in, all of the above. You know, you're standing on the side waiting to go across the floor and you're watching Susie Q do a lovely jeté and you're like mentally like, oh, I can do that. You know, there's lots of other things that are, I feel like a dance classroom is a learning environment in and of itself. There's so many things happening around you. Um, and I think it's also the teacher's role to have that open environment, have that, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but um, <laughs> every child and every individual desires uh, to be known and acknowledged. And I feel like that's um, really important and it's super visible in a dance class. You know, someone gets a correction and they're like, oh, they're noticing me. Or even if you get a compliment in something that, in a way that you're moving, you know, yeah. they're getting that acknowledgement. Um, so I think it's super, super important, um, especially for a dance class or a dance curriculum. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there are studios that offer, as Melissa said, specific classes designed to serve students that are autistic and as well as other disabilities, uh, uh, learning disabilities or physical disabilities. Um, what are the benefits of having targeted classes versus integrated, or do you think it should all be integrated? And I'd be interested to, to hear what, you know, Elizabeth, I know you're you're very knowledgeable about this as well. What What is the answer there? Um, I, to be honest, I don't think there is a straightforward answer whatsoever. Um, I think both of them have their, um, benefits. Um, obviously, like we said, targeted classrooms that you're getting specialized individual attention, a program mm -hmm. that's designed for them. They're in a yeah. classroom of students that are very similar. Um, especially when it, excuse me, comes to reading or something like that. They're normally in this small group. It's very individualized. Um, and then obviously as we're getting into, you know, integrating them, I, I feel like almost like a targeted classroom is a great stepping stool. Like when I worked at the preschool, um, you know, I would take the student out of the classroom, show them how they can kind of move their body to benefit them as they go back in. But the whole goal was to get them to go into a public school and know how to use those skills. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, a great stepping stool and not saying that, you know, targeted classrooms are bad or anything like that. But I think that if they're used kind of together to climb this ladder um, of success mm -hmm. that's built around the child, I think that's, I think that's kind of the most important so then it becomes a responsibility of the studio and the educators to make sure, like we were saying earlier, that the students are, the, the, the teachers, I'm sorry, are equipped and um, prepared to deal with different different students with different needs in their classrooms, which, which, is, the, the, which is the problem. That's, that's what we need to address is making sure that our teachers are prepped to deal with anything because there is no regulation, right? right? And, I, yeah. and I think... And I know that's hard as far as um, oftentimes it comes to a, a lot of like funding options. Like, oh, we don't yeah. have funding to teach our teachers how to do this or our dance teachers how to feel better as they go into a different school or a different environment. Um, and, I, and I totally understand that also being on the coordinator side. Um, but I also think that it's like, a dance teacher's responsibility in particular um, because there is there because there isn't that regulation that we should feel like we need to just gain as much knowledge as possible or even if you know that you're having a student come into your classroom that is autistic or that you're having that integrated classroom I would want to know as much as I can to better my students and also make me feel more comfortable in the classroom. So gaining that knowledge is, like we said, there's so many resources online, books, blah, 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 um, groups you can join. Um, and we have some of those resources like, later. Like, yes. You provided us with a lot of resources and links that we're going to drop into the chat later for everybody to, to be able to take, um, take advantage of and read and learn. Um, yeah. And I know that some students, go undiagnosed. There are a number of reasons that diagnoses don't get made for students in general. Um, usually sometimes parents feel like there's a stigma um, that, that goes around actually being evaluated and diagnosed. Um, I've heard, regardless of what your opinion is at all, you know, I don't want to give them, put in their head that they have an automatic disadvantage, um, those types of things, which I don't necessarily agree with, but um, you know, they, they go undiagnosed a lot of times because of parental or societal pressures um, that stigmatize um, things like that. So we want to be prepared and we want to, even if we have a child that is not diagnosed in our class, what are some of the presentations? And I think you mentioned some of, mentioned some of them earlier. What are some of the presentations of students that have um, autistic students um, that we may see that we may want to make note of so that we can make sure that they have an environment that is safe and comfortable for them? Yeah, absolutely. And um, what I think is great about dance classes in particular is that you're catching them out of their normal situation. You know, they're not, they're not in a math class. They're not in a 
reading, language arts, history, whatever class, you're not sitting at a desk in a classroom environment, you're actually getting them to move and probably in new ways, you know, they're not in PE class where they're not just jumping up and down or stretching or anything like that. You're really trying, you know, let's move today, how we're feeling. That's like this, you know, basic, easy. They don't have to talk. They don't have to do anything. They just move. Um, so at that, in, in that way, you can also see students, um, if they avoid eye contact or if they want to be alone during class or if they um, they get upset by minor changes, whether it's like a body, maybe they like facing front and you ask everyone to turn to the back and someone does like is in denial of that. They mm -hmm. like seeing themselves. Um, sometimes it's often like a body movement. If they like flap their hands or rock their well, you might be able to see that in a classroom setting, but they're told to sit at their desk, sit mm -hmm. there. But at, as a dance, in a dance class, they're encouraged to do that. But mm -hmm. maybe you see a student waiting in line to go across the floor and you're still seeing that, that body movement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe they avoid or resist physical contact. If you're teaching in a modern class and someone doesn't want to, you know, balance or push up against someone. Mm -hmm. um, that's often a common sign. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, um, it was just kind of weird for kids, but they're overly safe. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. maybe they cautious. don't want it's to, cautious. yeah, they're very, very cautious. Mm -hmm. They're like, maybe they don't want to um, jump as far as they want to jump. Maybe mm -hmm. it has to be like a stepping stool. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many things and I encourage everyone to obviously go on to the National Autism Association website. There's a huge list and huge amounts of resources. That is like my number one resource mm -hmm. that I gave Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, but hyperactivity, impulsivity, short attention spans, these are all things that I think as dance teachers, we can easily see. Mm -hmm. It's like whether you're doing um, something at the bar where everyone's supposed to be doing the same thing, you're gonna easily be able to see something at right. a kind of out of line, or right. if you're in an improv movement class and someone does the same thing over and over again. Um, well, and I think it's worth noting, it seems to be the answer to a lot of things that we talk about on this show, but um, open communication with parents is the parents of the child and the, the dancers should be extremely important and the top priority because you know, it, working together, we can get so much further and, and make sure that that child's needs are met. And that's going to be different from the next one and the next one and the next one. But at a time when I think there is there's this tendency to for dance studio owners or directors or teachers to push the parents away um, because it, it just it gets overwhelming at times. And I've been on that side of it, too. Um, it, you know, that's a time. This is a time more than ever. We need to kind of open our door and, and open that line of communication and nurture and foster that relationship so that the needs of our students are being met. I also think it's very important that we note that a lot of the things that you just talked about, Kelly, those presentations often come across as behavioral issues. Um, it's a great point. It's a great yeah, point. It, it, break, it breaks my heart now, when, especially when I think of when I was dancing, when autistic students were not served probably as well as they are now or people weren't paying as close attention because there were so many times that in dance class people were chastised or moved to the back or even asked to sit out or leave because they couldn't stand still or they wouldn't do a certain movement or they wouldn't or even when we were preparing for competitions and things like that the eye contact and look at the judges and look up and you know, those things that we were doing, which we actually were going to talk about, I'm probably getting into to the last topic a little bit, some of the things that are counterproductive, um, but we'll get to that later. But it really does, um, it really is an eye opener for me to see that a lot of those presentations are considered behavioral or could be considered behavioral. And probably we have been very, very um, neglectful of those as, as, a, as an industry. Absolutely. And I mean, I grew up in like a very ballet school. It was like everyone looked the same, did the same. If you weren't the same. Yeah, um, it was a like problem. A, growing up in that environment, yeah. I think really affected the way I think about things now. Um, when, even, even when it comes to my teaching styles, um, 
And obviously with the outreach work that I do, um, mm -hmm. trying to help so many teachers. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I love that. Thank you so much. So what are some of the key things to move into what I just kind of touched on a little bit too early? What are some of the key things to remember when we're doing lesson planning for integrated classes? So not necessarily classes where we have targeted um, um, and designed specifically for autistic students, um, but ones that are com ones that are combined. Um, so what are some of the things that we can remember to do physically in our classes as we do lesson planning to, to serve and our this is the time people out there watching this either now or later, you're going to be planning your schedules for 21, 22 very soon. I know that you're already thinking about it and the wheels are turning. So this is the time to integrate a lot of this information into your schedules and make the changes instead of waiting a whole nother year. Mm -hmm. um, let's do, let's make 2021 or 21, 22, the dance year that, that we see a lot of this cleared up on our schedules a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to, I want to kind of touch on this in two different ways, just because I know some people might be watching where they're teaching artists, just going into the school, um, into a school setting, into an integrated classroom, um, but also just going in for an hour and coming out. And then I also want to touch base as far as like a dance educator where you're teaching a class all through the year and get to know your students. Um, so as a, so as a dance educator, I mean, I guess they're all dance educators. Yeah. Let me rephrase that. Um, so as a dance teacher that has a classroom for a full year, whether it's in school setting or in a studio yeah. setting, I think that it's super important to, especially when teaching in an integrated classroom, to um, kind of rethink and reimagine your classroom. Some of the things that are super important are things that you might think of in a normal classroom, a daily check-in. Um, could be something nonverbal and verbal. Mm -hmm. So when they come into the classroom, hey, how are you doing? Or maybe they flip a red or a green thing on lack of words, oh, words. Post -it. <laughs> on the wall board, yes. Um, or, you know, that also, and I'm going to touch on Elizabeth's comment that I noticed is the consent to touch is totally a big thing as far as kids. Um, so that could also be, I think wall boards are just amazing. Um, so maybe a verbal check-in and a visual check-in. Mm -hmm. Flip it on how you're feeling. Yes, I'm okay with being touched. No, I'm not today. And that kind of, whether they, you'll get that verbal communication and then you'll also get that visual. Mm -hmm. um, and that can also appeal, you know, if someone doesn't like talking, they might just walk straight to the board. Mm -hmm. And that's also gonna change how your classroom is run. You know, if you have a lot of kids that come in and are, are like red, you know, maybe not doing um, high partnering work that day or, you know, some, no one's going to feel the need to go into like team building activities. <laughs> On a rain day, yeah. Yeah. And is, a, it, is it important to note that this can, I mean, that's easy. So throwing up a wall, a, a wall chart like that or a sign is something really simple to do, but how cool is that, that we could do that for all of our students and, and not just ones that are autistic. We can do it for all of our students. And um, it's just another way to communicate and be in touch and, and put our, our thumb on the pulse of how our students are feeling when they walk in the room so we can serve their needs better. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest things about being or teaching an integrated classroom is that you don't want anyone else to know that it's integrated. You, right. you want mm -hmm. them to come in thinking that it's like every other class, like this is like just a normal class. And as a teacher, you want them to be like, this is what I do for my classroom. I set up this wall board. Every yeah. student has to tell me how they feel as they walk in. Um, so that's like a huge part of integrating a class um, I feel like the dance teacher and the teacher themselves always, always, always have to be on their toes. We are dance teachers. We are creative. We are, we're not like teaching math where there's only one way to teach one plus one. There are so many different ways to teach our one lesson plan. Um, so I always, you know, if you have one lesson plan written down, um, think of like three backup plans or not even a backup plan, like three ways that you can teach that in one thing. If we're working on shapes 
Can you create your shape standing up? Or maybe you just want to create your shape drawing it in the air. Or maybe you want to create your shape with a partner. You know, there's so many other ways. Um, and then they can kind of pick and choose. So, um, and there's like a, a very fine line um, between structure and creativity. You want like, um, you want to set a very structured class, mm -hmm. meaning this is the time that we warm up. This is the time we're going across the floor. This is the time we're doing our closing circle or sharing. Mm -hmm. The in-between of what happens in each thing is totally creative and totally up to the teacher. But even having on our wall board, our time, this is our warm up time from this time to this time is really going to help students no matter where they are um, connect with that. Oh, maybe it's just a normal student who's like, I really don't like doing bar, but I know that I'm only in bar for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that helps as well. Um, so having a super structured class remaining creative and having other options when teaching a lesson plan is mm -hmm. huge, even the smallest little thing. And then the other thing is I think language. Um, language is huge as far as being a dance teacher in an integrated class. And, um, and it's also kind of how you're brought up in your dance world, you know, in your, as being a ballerina, I was thought, oh no, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. You know, obviously we want to try and stay away from that. And we want to allow students to have the verbal and nonverbal expression. Um, so maybe a student doesn't feel like making a shape today, but maybe they want to describe their shape. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just want to say, hey, my, my shape kind of looks like a sailboat, but with like a wavy bottom or, you know, whatever, whatever their shape yeah. is. Um, mm -hmm. But having them have the option to have a verbal and a nonverbal. Um, is always like a kind of a great way to go. Um, and obviously as a teacher, you always wanna set up your classroom for success. So mm -hmm. taking every lesson one step at a time, always have a fallback plan, structure your classroom mm -hmm. and stick to that structure. Mm -hmm. There's always like, oh, we're running a little behind. I'm telling you, there might be that one student that's like, Miss Kelly, no, Miss Kelly, Miss Kelly, Miss Kelly, we're two minutes over, Miss Kelly, we're two minutes mm -hmm. over. And that's really gonna, I'm, that might totally mess up their day um, and really throw off your classroom. <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> so, I, I am this student. <laughs> I, have, I have two kids on Zoom that do that. They're like, Miss Kelly, Miss Kelly, we have a minute left. Miss Kelly, I have five minutes left. I'm like, oh my God, okay, I'm going. Um, but, I mean, it keeps you accountable on the time. You know, we go over sometimes in the dance class and that that's, those are good people to have around. <laughs> yeah, we have to, we have to realize that for some students, that is, that's a world rocker um, to have your structure disrupted. Um, for some students, it is, you know, a world destroyer to have to do partner work uh, when, you know, you may have some type of sensory issues that prevent you or have you not wanting to be, to be touched. Uh, Elizabeth said, uh, her dance teacher, former instructor once said, yes, I understand that you can't handle being touched today. And also you have to participate in this partner work to get credit for today. <laughs> yes. So I'm sure I see you don't want to do it and it's really bad for you, but if you want to grade, you're still going to have to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the, you know, the, the crux is of like, you know, old school is you do what I say. This is the way I run my room right. and you're going to follow my rules because that is respect and that is hard work. And, you know, we're all about discipline. And moving into we know better, we do better. We know so much more now about how to help um, and and serve all of all of these different types of students and their needs. So um, I think that's where the challenge is because again, dancers steeped in tradition and history, it, it's really important um, in this weird dichotomy of artistic evolution. You know, so so making sure that we're evolving in in our managing our classrooms is really really important. Yeah, absolutely. I always like to say movement that has boundaries and structures. That's how I love to describe a dance class. It's a great um, saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it goes, and I would love that it went for like every kind of class. But, yeah. You know, I'm not great in history or math. Not my strong suit, so I don't know how that would go. <laughs> um, how does dance benefit autistic students? Ooh, 
Yes. That's, oh, there's so many, so, so many. And we kind of talked about this briefly. Um, you are, we're in a dance class. You are catching students um, not in their normal situations. Um, so that is pretty, one of the biggest things I think is either an integrated classroom or a targeted dance class, but you are pushing them outside of their comfort zone or more in their comfort zone. They're like, I love dance because I don't have to talk at all and I can communicate exactly what I need to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, so dance is a freedom of expression, um, which is a really basic tool for healthy development for the body. Um, you gain that body awareness, um, but also for yourself, for your inner, your brain, everything. You can connect what you're thinking to your body. Um, and that is, you know, portrayed through movement, obviously through, um, I love doing an exercise that's super simple, um, with students that, you know, show me how you feel today. Easy mm -hmm. thing. They, they might just stand there, but that might be how they're feeling right in that moment. Um, mm -hmm. so it's a great way to communicate with students without using that verbal, um, that verbal cueing. Um, but also allowing them to, um, to use the verbal cueing when need. Maybe they don't feel like moving today and we have that. Um, but yeah, movement leads to better orientation, like I said, and body awareness. Um, it pushes them to do new things, um, new movement patterns. A lot of times, you know, they're just in PE classes and they're jumping up and down. They're learning how to do jumping jacks, but they're not learning I don't know how to like contract and extend, how to like move their chest without moving the rest of their body. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many ways. And then obviously in a dance class, there is that structure naturally. You're having, for example, a uh, ballet class, you know, you have bar, you mm -hmm. have center, you have across the floor. They're provided with that structure that tends to really help students on the, on the, <laughs> your puppy has, has oh you thank you um <laughs> so there's so there's so many benefits and then one of my biggest things that i love to do is to bring dance into the home um mm -hmm. i think it's so important that if whether a dance class is for you know a hobby whether the student wanted to do it whether the parent is pushing them to do it whether it's in their school i think bringing in either homework assignments or talking to parents and being like, can you do these exercises at home with your student? And it also connects the parent to the student in a whole nother way. You right. know, there's a simple mirroring exercise where, you know, when a, if a student is coming home from work or work from school and, <laughs> um, you know, the parent's like, how's your day? let's mirror it, you know, the student can take them through their day in this movement and mm -hmm. all the parent, the parent doesn't have to say anything, but they're following them in this movement and it connects them in a totally different way. Um, right. So I always love to connect the studio, wherever it may be, to the home. Bring mm -hmm. it, bring it home, bring the communication all around, like we were said earlier, mm -hmm. teacher, parent, communication, um, and all around, yeah. And I, I'm not sure if you have any uh, much experience with this, but um, I have seen in different, uh, specifically in Target, not to, you know, big up Target, um, but I've seen it in Target where they are making clothes that um, are specifically for autistic children um, without seams, without irritating tags, with um, things that, you know, can irritate the skin or it can aggravate sensory, sensory issues. What should we keep in mind, in your opinion, and I'm sorry, this is totally not one of the topics that I, but I just came to this as I was talking, what should we keep in mind as we choose costumes? Um, for oh. students, because they got all kind of ruffles and feathers and <laughs> rhinestones and all types of things. And sequins and yeah. Oh my God. I remember some of those costumes being like, Oh my God, get this, like the, the sequence and the straps that would like yeah. dig into your that arm. Dig into your skin, right? Or you get a half sequin that got cut off in the seam and it's scratching you. Like all those things are, are horrible. But what, what might we want to keep in mind as we choose costumes for our integrated classes um, to try to make autistic students comfortable? Yeah, I would actually really 
just talk to the students. Um, be mm -hmm. like, hey, what do you feel comfortable dancing in? Mm -hmm. um, and then even if there's a whole bunch of different answers, um, finding some, you know, a lot of classrooms or studios have a theme. You know, if you're mm -hmm. doing an underwater theme, maybe someone feels more comfortable having seaweed down their <laughs> arm and maybe someone just wants to be like a blue fish and is just a blue shirt. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's so many ways around that, but I think the, the biggest thing is just talking to them. I think in a mm -hmm. dance classroom, we're very um, used to just being kind of told what to do or mm -hmm. how to move or what costume to wear. No one ever asked me what costume I wanted to wear. I was, I, I was just shoved into this scary sequence, sometimes bell bottom thing. Um, <laughs> and no one ever asked me, but bringing that um, into the classroom, being, being like, hey, what do you guys feel comfortable moving in or not even comfortable moving in, being comfortable seen in, that mm -hmm. is also huge. You know, maybe they're not comfortable wearing a leotard and tights on stage in front of people. Mm -hmm. that, could, that is huge. So take it back and just ask them, you know, what do you guys feel? Hey, we have this performance coming up. What are you gonna feel most comfortable in expressing yourself, putting yourself out there? What do you wanna dance in? And Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth saying also just being asked would be amazing, even if you are willing to wear something you don't particularly like for five minutes on stage. Again, just asking you right. know, about your comfort with that is, is a step in uh, the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Kelly, we like to, we have to, we require. Um, <laughs> All work. We require um, a, a actionable step for our viewers. So what is the, we want them to do something between now and the next time we see them, which is next Friday. So what's the one action that you want our list, listeners and viewers um, to take between now and next week to make progress in this area? Um, one super simple op, like thing to do, and literally everyone and anyone can do it, is to just go to the National Autism Association website. Literally the easiest thing to do. And it has so many resources, but in particular, they have these things called safety boxes for the parent and for the teacher that will give you, if you just go online, it'll give you so many resources in this little tiny safety box that you can get delivered to you. And sometimes as teachers, you get it for free. Um, depending on your district awesome. and things like that. Um, but you can just go on. And then as for parents, they provide safety boxes for parents to better equip you in the home. Um, there's just a whole bunch of resources on there, steps to take. Um, there's a M chart, which we will talk about in a little bit. Thank you, Melissa, um, for putting that in there. There's a thing called an M chart where parents can um, kind of, mark off things that they're noticing um, with their child and then bring it to the doctor and it can just be very small. They can be doing it every month. It can just be, um, yeah, that's like the easy, there's so many resources on there and it's good reading, honestly. It's, they're always up to date. They have great articles on there, um, but it's just great to kind of better familiarize yourself and always learn. Mm -hmm. It's all right there. Absolutely. You don't have to go to a million sources. Right. Exactly. I'm going to keep popping. Kelly gave us a number of links and resources. Uh, I'm going to keep popping those in the chat, even as we close out, because I don't want you to miss out on anything. Elizabeth had a great point. Follow autistic adults on social media. They are the best at explaining what autistic kids need since they have been there and they've been that autistic kid. Um, so follow that is such a great idea, Elizabeth. And we have said that a few times in some of our topics. Like if you actually just follow and listen to the people who have had the life experience that we're ta you're talking about. You so want much to learn from that. So I mean, much. It's amazing. You can go to any doctor and any book and any website, but if you actually talk to someone who has been and done and seen, it's so much, so much more, um, more beneficial to you. And not only is they appreciate that. 
Yeah. I also want to um, point out while we're talking about resources, um, Trisha Gomez and her team over at RhythmWorks Integrative Dance has created a groundbreaking rhythm and dance program designed for those with learning differences and special needs. It is an amazing, amazing program. And um, I am putting the link uh, here in the chat as well, um, because, it, you know, we're, we're doing some work with them on the Apollo side and, you know, our shocks are seamless. And so we're talking with them about that. And um, compression is really good for autistic um, students and, and, and other special needs. And so, um, but, but they really do have a great program that caters to, the, you know, uh, youth organizations uh, that, that specifically teach children. So everybody check that out. You can get certified. They offer scholarships sometimes to, uh, to get the certification but gosh, how worth it. Um, and of course, then there's the STEPS 2020 initiative, um, which has an integrative dance uh, section as part of that. Um, and it's completely free. So if you uh, click the link in our bio on Instagram at Apollo Performance, go to our website, you can take the STEPS 2020 initiative course completely free um, and at your own pace. So check that out. Um, you know, we hope this episode inspires you to dig deeper into your daily thoughts and habits so that we can change we can be the change we want to see in the world and in our dance community. When you know better, you do better. I'm going to keep saying uh, that. And it's the entire premise of why we do this show. Um, so uh, Melissa and I are definitely on this journey with you. We learned things today from people watching and from um, obviously Kelly. Uh, so we're so grateful for that. And we're always grateful for that, the, the knowledge and the expertise of our guest panelists. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for, for your time and your energy towards all of this. It was so helpful. Um, the recording of this full episodes and all of our episodes are available on Facebook and um, Apollo's IGTV, both at Apollo Performance, as well as Turning Point Dance Creations, uh, which is at TPDC underscore on underscore IG. And if you register to join us on Zoom, you will get a recording of each week's episode emailed to you. We ask you to please share, share, share um, so we can get the word out and affect real change about all of these topics. We're looking for experts and topics for 2020. 2021. We just had a meeting and started scheduling for 2021. We're really excited to bring this back to you in the new year. Um, so if there's something you want to learn about or a guest, you, you know, you're, you have some expertise that you want to share and you're, you're interested in being a guest panelist, you can message us info at Apollo Performance or message us on Facebook or Instagram um, at Apollo Performance. Uh, thank you again to Kelly Flansberg for joining us today. And as always, thank you to my friend and co-host, Melissa McDaniel, for being on this journey with me. Um, you all have some homework. We have some homework uh, and take advantage of the incredible resources that we've put here in the chat. Chat, um, and that Kelly shared with us today and that we've talked about. Uh, join us next Friday for episode 10 as we discuss how can we recognize and work to eliminate racial bias in the dance studio environment. We hope you will join us. Those are, that's Friday, every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. Until then, we hope you continue your journey beyond the steps and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Have a good one, guys. Okay, thank you.